Welcome one and all to Hearthstone Masters Tour Asia Pacific Online. This is Championship Sunday, so you could not have joined us at a better moment. One match done for the day with Alu Temu taking a uh, somewhat shaky, in my personal opinion, but still well-deserved win over Old Boy to get through to the semi-finals. Based on what I've personally seen from him in GM, I definitely expect the absolute best of the best. So he's definitely going to be having to turn things around in the semi-final, especially subtle, given that he is going to be facing either RNG Lee or Tice, both of whom are staggeringly uh, scary opponents to be up against. They are, for sure. Um, and speaking of people that have turned things around, I think we have to put Lee somewhere near the absolute top of this list because my presiding memory of Lee, and same for a lot of people, <laughs> honestly, is a pretty poor performance at a championship event that he qualified for several years ago. And obviously we're not as in touch uh, with the Chinese scene as we are with, uh, with many others. Um, so that means I hadn't heard much from him up until this point, but now he's got a reputation with being told building in the, the Chinese scene as one of their most successful players. He really does. Uh, we got a little, uh, Lorinda got a message from Benage, who is a very, very strong ladder player, a very well-respected Chinese Hearthstone player, who I believe is one of the few players to uh, play on some of the other regions outside of the Chinese client. Uh, but he's been saying that he is undeniably the best performing Chinese player over the last year. What with there being two main ways that the players in China can qualify through to playoffs to the uh, World Championship. A little bit of a different system to what we have here with GM. You can get a bunch of points or you can win one of the Gold Series Championships. And basically Lee's done both. He's qualified in both metrics that it is possible to do under. And so even for probably the most well-known Hearthstone player in the world at the moment in Tice. It is still a very, very difficult match for him to be up against. But Tice, man, you can just feel how much he wants to be taking the win here. Yesterday on stream, he was just gushing about how good it feels to compete. He just loves it. It's the spirit of competition that he truly lives for. Yeah, and if you're wondering why we spend so much time setting up uh, Lee, it's because you all know who Tice is, right? <laughs> we don't have to cover the bases on this one. Of course, one of the world's legendary Hearthstone players at this point. And looks like we're going to pick up where we left off with a, uh, another rogue coming in after a very rogue-heavy series uh, last time. Derek? I'm here for it. I love a good bit of rogue action. Uh, Tice going with the more standard secret rogue, it's fair to say. I've seen uh, a few players ragging on Letter for his stealth version of rogue as one of the other top eight players with a slightly different build. Uh, this definitely is, I think, amongst the majority of pro players, the preferred version of the deck. One spy mistress slotted in there, which... Uh, uh, you know, I, I say I don't like only because I've been told by better players than I recently that you're not supposed to include it anymore. Uh, and I can see why. I think you want a little bit more consistency with the higher end of the deck. Because one thing that we're definitely seeing is that once Galakron does come down, even once Togwaggle's Wondrous Wand comes down, you're picking up a lot of cheap cards. And so personally, I'm in favor of making the deck maybe that little bit heavier with taking out the likes of Spy Mistress. Yeah, that's very fair. I think, you know, obviously those are the power plays in the deck, even though Galakron in particular has been hit with the nerf, um, still means that, you know, you do want to have that payoff. You don't want to be drawing too many backstabs and spy mistress, especially off your Galakron this time, as I saw you finding it equally hilarious as I did, as we saw our first <laughs> one mana backstab coming off the uh, Galakron during play yesterday. Yeah, and as we saw from the bands there, double warrior band away. It's definitely, I think, to be expected. This was undeniably level one in the strategy that players were going for. A couple of different ideas that we'll be seeing in the top eight. I believe Saiyan, down in our last top eight uh, quarterfinal match of the day, before we head to the semifinals, is going for a ban hunter strategy with bringing the mage as well, which I'm very interested in, even if I don't think it's necessarily the strongest way to go. But for our players here, really just best deck strategy that we are seeing. And uh, it looks like, with uh, highlighting the dragon spell druid here, that we're going to be having a dragon versus rogue matchup, which, again, no matter how many times I see it, my, uh, my heart is telling me that druid should be miles in the lead. But every time I see it, it really feels less and less like that's the way. Yeah, I would agree. I think early on, I was very much of that opinion as well, that it was just, you know, early Glowfly, GG, game over. Mm. But um, I think, you know, maybe to the contrary of what we were saying earlier, if you do have a bit of that additional early game in your rogue, that can help you out in this particular matchup. Not necessarily 
for straight up aggro, rushing your opponent down, but because you play multiple minions in the early game, which can then be used to uh, trade away that big threat if you do get there. And then when it comes to the big heavy hitters later in the game, well, that's where Blackjack Stunners can really make a mess of the, the Druid game plan. So Rogue certainly has some game in the matchup, um, but Druid, we've seen it do Druid things. You have seen it do Druid things more than most, uh, <laughs> Derek, as an APAC caster. I have indeed, but I'm excited to get into casting some of the best of the best, the European GMs once again. And uh, I do think that while the Druid has a fairly standard game plan here, the Rogue has a lot more going on because obviously game plan A through Y, I suppose, is big questing or Edwin as soon as you possibly can. But C that sometimes comes into effect there is uh, where you don't have that early giant minion to be throwing down and you need to try and piece together a way to survive until later on. Uh, and another way that that happens where you're unable to get the giant minion right at the start of the game is when you have Edwin on the play. Do you think that's still a correct keep against the Druid? I do still kind of like it, yeah. There's still a lot of ways that you can piece it together and it is still a big win condition for you in the, in the matchup. So I'm fine with holding on to it personally. Yeah, I think so too. It's one of the things that I personally realized uh, a little bit, uh, half, uh, sorry, after playing the matchup a fair bit, is that Edwin doesn't have to come down on turn three or four. You can quite happily get it on turn six, turn seven, a little bit later on, as long as you're not dying to an early Glowfly Swarm. And uh, you should be just fine. Should be absolutely happy and moving along, as I think Tice will be doing it. He's now got proactive play on turn two, proactive play on turn three as well, with the Canned Taker ready to go. And while Lee has got a decent hand here, the nerf to Fungal Fortunes is uh, pretty clearly here going to be hurting him quite drastically as he is instead just ripping an unactivated Breath of Dreams, play, uh, praying to get the dragon off the top to get the mana, but unable to do so. Still, however, I think we have a very even game on our hands. Lee, plenty of ramp, plenty of card draw, just needs to find the meat of the deck to go along with that kind of a ramp card draw sandwich. That's right, Tice here, having picked up Candle Taker, oh, really is a pretty reasonable on curve option here. It's just whether Tice wants to cash in this seal fate is probably the only consideration, but I think playing minions against Druid is probably the vanilla strategy, and there's no I see no real reason to divert from it here. Agreed completely. The uh, the real choice here now, I suppose, on the Druid side, interestingly enough, the, the Rogues had a very straightforward game plan so far. The Druids had the tough choice. Is it fungal or overgrowth now? Yeah, I was talking about this with uh, Lorinda as we were preparing for day one, I believe it was, as to how this curve in particular plays out now. Because he said this was the one that was giving him the most problems when you have um, Overgrowth, Fungal Fortunes, and Coin in the same hand. Obviously, this is complicated even further by the Innovate on top of all of that as well. Right. And uh, maybe the Innovate um, would lean me personally more towards the Overgrowth. Um, mm. Actually, no, thinking about it, if he, if I actually do like this fungal, okay, I don't like that fungal fortune, <laughs> but I like the concept of fungal fortunes because then with the, uh, with the extra innovate and the coin, you have the ability to not only then ramp out a glowfly swarm if you draw it, but then mm. power through from there with more ramp afterwards since you have both options. So actually breaking it down a little bit more, I think fungal fortunes is the right choice. Yeah, I'm on board with it as well. It does, uh, unfortunately, mean, however, that he is left with a uh, few choices in terms of the meat of his deck. As I was saying, the Mount Seller would be premium here to get him back in the game. Uh, the choice, once again, becomes a little bit more difficult for the Rogue, though, here in a 6-6 Edwin being available uh, to come down on this turn. But I don't know about, I don't know about you, Sol, but I feel like there's a huge break point between 6-6 oh, six, and 8-8. Eight, eight. Like, 6-6 six, six is never winning a game on its own. 8-8 theoretically can get there on the back of just a big Edwin. Yeah, I do think 6-6 six, six plus all this additional power in play, you know, plus one of them being a reborn minion that's already difficult to remove. I do think that is worth considering, but of course that does involve throwing out your own backstab here as well, which is a bit of a problem. 4-4 mm. Edwin, certainly not something that I was expecting too heavily, but Tice, really simple game plan. So far this game has just played maximum power on every turn. Yeah, it's really interesting, isn't it? It's... I think in no small part expecting a Glowfly Swarm on the following turn because after mm -hmm. you've just seen uh, Glowfly, even discarding two minions, I think with nothing else especially bad happening, Coin Glowfly is the expected outcome on this turn. And this is the best way to play around that, holding the backstab and getting maximum minions on board. 
Um, and to be fair, his follow-up game plan is looking fairly strong. He has Kronks, he has Seal Fate to get up to level 2 Galakrond. So he is not all in on this early Edwin plan, which I think sure. shows uh, good understanding from Tice in the flexibility of the matchup. Because while I was joking that saying through a, plans A through Y were Edwin or questing, uh, you know, there is more flexibility in the game plan than that. You can divert to a Togwaggle or uh, Galakrond game plan. Yeah, and I do think, yeah, furthermore, in the context of what's happened on his opponent's side this game, you say he's not necessarily all in on Edwin. Lee might just be all in on Glowfly Swarm because we saw, you know, two very key minions getting discarded off that Funkle Fortunes. True. So Tice might feel like if he sets up to be comfortable against a Glowfly Swarm, he should have enough to beat pretty much everything that Lee has left to offer from this point. Your presence offends me. Again, just spending all your mana on this turn, making it as difficult as possible for Lee to get any kind of a strong development. Because it's even approaching the point here where a Mount Seller, if it were to come down on this turn, even with three, maybe four spells coming down at the same time, Tice could still mop it up as uh, he can do here against the Glowfly. It's still just powerful response after powerful response. I mean, it's just lethal represented yeah. <laughs> before we get into all of that. Yeah, problem number one, lethal on board, which means uh, <laughs> coin crystal power is going to have to come out here before anything else. But even then, that's what, up to 18? And there's yeah. 4, 8, 11, 13, 14, 15 showing on board? It is right knock, knock, knocking on lethal's door here. Uh, I'm thinking that the best way to go about it is not to get too greedy and just to make a uh, questing yeah, start yes. happening on this turn. Uh, yeah, don't try agreed. and get any nonsense with Seal Fey into Spell Lackey, into Eviscerate or whatever. Let's just take the safe route, clear off the board, and you should be winning the game most of the time. Completely agree. I imagine this Candle Taker will take up an additional trade. That's where my certainty about the situation kind of comes to a crashing halt, though. Whether or not it's worth sending in the Ancestral Guardian or double Pharaoh Cat to pick off another one, hmm. I'm far less convinced about. It's really interesting, isn't it? And whether or not the Edwin should trade for that matter as well, because yeah. Savage Raw bumps it up to five attack, so it's still not a clean kill on the Edwin if you don't take the right. value trade. Yes. Um, yeah, the trades really are does... actually more clean without Savage Raw, weirdly enough, if you don't take the value <laughs> trade, which kind, of, which kind of incentivizes you not to, right? Like, if you took right. one value trade, it's a clean trade for your opponent yeah. without a Savage Raw. I think this is a smart Edwin to face. I think you can very much get away with that. Yeah, I like it too. It also means that with lots on board, Lee can't just like happily go for overflow first. Or I should say, if he does, there's a downside to the plan because he starts healing up the opponent's minions that little bit more. So hero power moonfire become that hmm. little bit less effective at clearing things up. But he's just biting the bullet. Yeah, it's all he's got, really. Yeah. Seeing the other options, Tice deliberately chose to trade this in a way where he would benefit slightly from the overflow as well. And um, choosing the Ancestral Guardian, trading, getting getting the damage reborn in play, same with the Candle Taker, instead of using his Veracats on board. Unlikely to make a huge amount of difference, it's only really uh, Moonfires and I guess the Hero Power, but actually thinking about it could be pretty important. Combinations of Bog Beam and Hero Power would have picked apart this board if he didn't pick up the heat. That's right. I think from Tice, this has just been a very good look at the actual discrete values that he's facing down. Not saying, uh, you know, or oh, you can probably clear this. How does he actually do it? Forcing him to work with the exact cards he has. And it means yeah. that Moonfire has to be used to clear off the 4 4 here. I suppose that's what you'd be wanting to do anyway. But it just makes everything that little bit tougher for Lee on the other side. That's hot. Guess what, Derek? Tice has played maximum damage worth of minions this turn and then passed his turn over. <laughs> I like the strategy. It makes sense yeah. to me still. Uh, approaching some interesting turns now where Tice next turn could hypothetically go shield step shield in order to get a full activated Galakrond sure. uh, on turn 9. Uh, obviously, we need to see what Lee uh, decides to develop first on this turn. But still, multiple options for how Tice wants to uh, approach this game plan.
Meanwhile, Lee dealing with scraps on the other side of the board. Yeah. Second Glowfly on that Emerald Explorer is what? almost the sum total of the threats that he has left in his deck after that disastrous discard on the Fungal Fortunes early on. Yeah, we're looking at like, what if he goes Glowfly, Soul, Vate, Heal off of the... Uh, he's just dead to hero power. Uh, from to the dagger, other side. Yeah. 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 No Got to take a more defensive route. We could see Fungal Fortunes trying to find uh, Iron Bark. Makes the most sense to me. Mm -hmm. uh, just to get any kind of defensive capabilities <laughs> online. But it's the second Mount Seller and Yasera oh that fight the dust at the end of it. And swiftly joining them will be Lee, who uh, at the end of a pretty unfortunate game there does end up losing to Tice. But I've got to say, even though the cards were not falling in the right way for Lee there, I think Tice did the best job possible of making it awkward, difficult at all points in the game for Lee to pull things back. Yeah, I do as well. Uh, the 4-4 Edwin did catch me a little bit by surprise, but it really was a very consistent plan from mm. Tice. He just generated maximum power every single turn. There was the one turn off where he had to react to the Glowfly Swarm, and that's the power of the card Glowfly Swarm. It can take basically any situation in the early game and flip yep. it on its head for at least one turn. Uh, but that's one of the crucial checkpoints of dealing with the Druid matchup is if you can deal with it that one turn, you're usually pretty comfortable to be able to then push back and go back on the aggression. We see it from Rogue there. We see it from Demon Hunter a million times before as well. The absolute king of being able to smash through Glowfly Swarm and keep on going. It really is key uh, to aggro success in that matchup. It is indeed. And so now with the Rogue out of the way, Tice is left with the Hunter and the Druid. Uh, the real difference, I suppose, here for Tice con uh, compared to the standard lineup, I guess, of just best decks is having Druid over the Quest Warlock, which I think he will be maybe a little bit sad about here. There's still a Demon Hunter on the other side for Lee, which you are always a little bit afraid of. But lining it up now anyway is Tice. I think this for him is the, uh, the hump to get over in the rest of this series. If he can get the Druid out of the way, I think Hunter is just a generically powerful enough of a deck to the point where he should be able to close things out. Yeah, I tend to agree with that. And we saw Tice have zero issues with getting this Druid over the line when we uh, when we joined him yesterday. <laughs> he True. had one of the most monstrous Druid draws you will ever see in your life. Ramping, I believe, five mana ahead of his opponent, mm. hitting 10 mana on his opponent's five mana turn uh, against Zim, I believe it was, fellow European Grandmaster. So Tice will be looking for another one of those power draws where it really matters now in the top eight. You may have seen a couple of weird inclusions there from Lee in his quest warlock as well. That was one of the other things that we were notified about from Benish, yes. the uh, Chinese Hearthstone player, is that he is uh, kind of pioneered the Chinese build of quest warlock with Hellfire, as you saw there, Doomsayer as well, interestingly enough. And uh, he's also apparently been touted with uh, being the inspiration for spreading Kartut Defender in the version of the deck, which, I mean, personally, I think it's kind of on about the same level as inventing planking. Like, it's not really something <laughs> to be proud of, to be perfectly honest, uh, but I guess it's something to put next to your name anyway. We need we need Lee to do a creator of Angry Birds and just destroy his own <laughs> creation so no one can play it anymore. Uh, yeah, but it's, it's a definitely an interesting build, and I get the impression that it'll probably be slightly better against the aggro versions when you're putting in, uh, you know, Doomsayer, Hellfire, and obviously Kartut Defender. Uh, yeah. He's going to be suffering in the Druid matchup because uh, I know you've been sad to see Kartut Defender. Abar, our wonderful producer, was saying it's the reason you play Quest Warlock is to play <laughs> Abyssal Summoners, which, uh, although a slight exaggeration, I can definitely see the uh, thinking behind. Uh, as we have seen time and time again, Quest Warlock missing the aggro matchups because there aren't that many, to be perfectly honest and then just suffering against the kind of more slow control matchups due to the fact that they don't have the pressure. Yeah, no secret that I am a, a big fan of the Abyssal Summoner build myself. Even in a lot of aggro matchups, I kind of you know leverage yeah. those Abyssal Summoners as my alternate win condition, so I don't really have to go all the way through to the, the Malagos combos or Dragon Queen Alexstrasza late in the game. I can just try and find a tempo swing with an Abyssal Summoner, but certainly, you know, an entire region of Hearthstone, it really seems to extend past China and most of the APAC players as well, we're seeing with Kartut Defenders in their decks. So, you know, if, if the entire region of playtesting groups have put time in and still come out with the idea that Kartut Defender was better for this tournament, and they can't all be that wrong.
Oh yes, just like they weren't wrong when they didn't play Combo Priest for three weeks. That was fun, <laughs> wasn't it? <laughs> but yes, I agree. There's, there's clearly a reasoning behind it. It just hasn't come into fruition in this particular matchup. But even with that aside, Lee is still able to hit Quest on turn four. The absolute dream versus Druid. This is where things uh, really start to even the playing field. Especially because Tyus has gone hero power, hero power. It's just nothing coming together for him. Yeah, he did have options uh, last turn while we were bleating on about the different builds of the deck, um, but it's they weren't very appealing. This isn't really one of those turbo glowfly win the game kind of matchups. It's a very, very different pan out from that. Um, he could have just played it there and been immediately so met with a crazy netherwing on the opposing side of the board and just be out an enormous amount of ramp and a huge resource from the board. You know, glowfly swarm quite often can just be played on curve just as a check if you don't have to dump additional resources into doing that. Otherwise, it's often gets saved for a Soul of the Forest play in this matchup. So do you think we are going to be seeing uh, Glowfly being saved specifically for Soul of the Forest? Does he have that liberty? I think with this hand, he might just throw it out. Mm. The problem is now he sees the Moarg on the other side of the board, which increases Lee's out significantly. If this right. was just empty board or just some other small minion in play, Questing Explorer in play or something like that, I think you would slam Glowfly immediately because then yeah. you're just like, okay, they have to have a two-card Moarg combo to be able to clear it or the Netherwing. Already seeing the Moarg, you know, this is a much braver play from Tice to be able to throw this out, but I do still kind of think it's necessary because... What else is his hand really doing at this point? Like, at best, he's going to look to perhaps to get an overflow going, in which case yeah. he needs to start dumping cards out of his hand anyway. That's exactly it for me. He's looking at having to go, like, innovate, moonfire, and then overflow anyway, which yeah. is pretty disastrous, using up some of your best zero mana spells before Mount Seller even sees the light of day. Uh, but, I mean, <laughs> it's kind of worse than that in a way, because there's, again, the Hellfire in Lee's version yes. of the deck, which makes yeah, it that yeah. little bit more likely that the board can be cleared off. Uh, I suppose I'll say, thankfully for Tice, it's Dark Skies that comes to hit the board. I think, honestly, you see this as a win as Tice, because it's so unlikely that this board sticks. It's just fringe possibilities. And so the fact that it's uh, a Dark Skies you're seeing, which is pretty good oh, against singular fun. minions, uh, means that you're not, uh, means that that has to be used instead of a Crazy Netherwing or Hellfire is pretty good for us. Yeah, for sure. I think Crazy Netherwing was, of course, the worst outcome in that scenario just because it was so much additional tempo alongside everything else. Yeah. Um, but seeing the Dark Skies, yeah, it's a pretty key card to get out of your opponent's hand. But we're searching really hard for silver linings here for Tice. There really aren't many of them. He's looking in some uh, pretty serious trouble with how quickly Lee has been able not just to pick apart the one early game push he was able to make, but also just quest completed at this point on turn five, which means he might be able to just start seizing immediate tempo if he gets some clutch life taps over the coming turns. To be fair, the life taps are not that likely to be insane because as we've said, Abyssal Summoner nowhere to be found, which is premium. <laughs> Malagos and Alexstrasza in hand. So you're really looking at Dragon Queen Alexstrasza as far and away the best card that you can possibly get here. So I think while sure. it's bad for Tice, he on average has a little bit of time to start converting this into some real pressure. That is, however, assuming he can find anything to do with his mana. I mean, what is this? I don't know what to tell you, Derek. This this is the exact opposite, the yang to the yin of the draw that Tice had yesterday that I was talking about. <laughs> No ramp, yeah. no threats. It's just been scrambling to make something happen, even ripped an overflow, and he's just finding himself in the sorry position of just having to ramp on turn seven, which is usually the point where you want to be blowing out the game with your mount sellers. Yeah, especially as it's kind of even worse than that. Due to filling up hand size, he's used Innovate Double Moonfire, which means the uh, likelihood of a good mount seller has been diminished drastically. Uh, it's the it's the worst of the worst. He just needs to get stuff happening I right now. No but if he does go for Fungal Fortunes, all of his minions are still in the deck, so he's pretty <laughs> likely to just get rid of them at that yeah. point as well. You can't just not do it, right? Like, you can't fall into wow. that trap. I think, yeah, I mean, you still just have to do it, right? Okay. Like, it's not disastrous because he was kind of overdrawing anyway if he drew a full hand. So yeah. it's it's bad, but it's still winnable, still salvageable for Tice in this game. 
Maybe. It's just, it's just a little druidy. It's still good. It's still good. <laughs> five turn rule. Five turn rule. I can still. <laughs> I can still do it. Uh, Lee's definitely going to be a bit uh, sad that he ended up using the coin that yeah i think we might have had a slight spectator issue um, yeah. on that one as i'd have to imagine it's probably just dumping aranasi uh, mm -hmm. is what happened at the end of that turn but it is a little bit uh unpleasant for him that he felt the need to use the coin there i actually wonder if you uh taking into account the how mediocre the average draw in his deck is off the hero power if it was worth saving the coin there purely to get down mali or alex a turn earlier Sure. Um, it, it, it's very close because obviously you want to tap as much as possible, but I think we're very possibly looking at another turn of very close to no development on turn eight now. Yeah, my only issue is I'm not entirely sure whether he wants to be coining out any of those dragons in the near future because he's he's seen an overflow, um, but he hasn't seen either crystal power come out of Tice yet. So jamming the Alexstrasza to his opponent's face is probably a hiding to nothing. And I think with you know a Rain of Fire and a zero cost Mortal Coil in his hand, if he's not going to end up using the Malagos for lethal, he wants to use it for a you know massively effective board clear as opposed to just dropping it down as a tempo minion. So maybe he just doesn't have plans. To, uh, to throw those cards out anytime soon and just felt comfortable throwing away the coin in that spot. Yeah, I think I think that's reasonable. It's just uh, kind of an interesting dynamic to explore there uh, for Lee as we do try and get these uh, spec issues sorted as soon as possible. Uh, but even having said that, you know, uh, the point I was trying to make there effectively was whether or not you go for it this turn uh, with a coin Malagos or he gets it down on turn nine. Uh, yeah. I am thinking... The, uh, the point is, sticking one of these dragons is good. That's how you get the pressure to start actually closing out the game. That is where Tice really starts to struggle. Yeah, we're just going to take a moment to sort out these tech issues here uh, to, so that we can fully appreciate the splendor of this final game because i have to say it's not often that you end up in these kind of situations where the druid doesn't just blow out the warlock at the start of the game at least in my experience from casting asia pacific uh, gm <laughs> and i think it does lead to some significantly more interesting scenarios um especially when you factor in that even though lee got a good draw because of how bad his build of the deck is for this matchup it kind of evens out at just a mediocre draw against a kind of bad draw against a favorable deck it, it, right. it's weird how the matchup kind of starts swinging back and forth right yeah it's kind of a fallacy to say but you know the abyssal summoner build you as soon as you gained that level of control like lee had there like he hard passed one yeah. turn before he even started playing the uh, the Aranasi Broodmothers. If you have Abyssal Summoner to play in that spot, that can just be game over a lot of the time yeah. against Druid. Uh, the reason why it's kind of a fallacy to bring that up is that he hasn't drawn Kartu Defenders either, so he wouldn't have had that option even if he was playing the Abyssal Summoner build of the deck, but it is at least to make the point a possibility when you are playing that build of the deck to just win from outright tempo in the mid game. But speaking of tempo, it's like Tice is doing a pretty stellar job of trying to buy this back, but we see that zero-cost craze Netherwing in Lee's hand is going to make a mess of most of this that we can see. Yeah, I mean, it's a complete last-ditch effort here, to be perfectly honest. We can see, based on the cards he had when we lost our uh, spectator feed a few turns ago, he's used up pretty much all of his cheap spells at this point. He has discarded one of the Mount Sellers, very possibly another in that median time as well. And so now it is, uh, I'd have to imagine, coming down to pretty much Ysera or Bust on the next turn. And even that, I think, is... Uh, I'm skeptical if that will get there. Well, that's kind of an Ysera. <laughs> hmm. Sure. It's the most Ysera-like card in his deck that isn't the Ysera. Uh, I'll take that. He is still going to lose, though, Subtle. <laughs> yes. <laughs> He can at least kill the Alex Straza, I suppose, and then, well, I should uh, have spoken more clearly. <laughs> Not that Ysera, the other one. See, I told you, it's right there. <laughs> Never question me, Darren. Stop being technically correct. <laughs> Job done. Yep, clean clear on the Alex Straza, just trying to salvage the time 
to get either of the Yaceras down onto the board. Yeah, and even having to use one of those crystal powers for a source of damage as opposed to healing is just adding one final nail to the coffin here as well. And I think, you know, just looking at Tice's body language as he's you know, progressed <laughs> through this game, I think he's mentally resigned this one to 1-1 uh, yeah. at this point, and he's moving on. Yeah, exactly. This is kind of contrary to, contrary to Lorinda's weird spiel yesterday where he was saying Bunny Hopper is too good to know when he's losing a game of Hearthstone. <laughs> um, to which I say, no, I think Tice is just good enough to know exactly how toasted he is in this game. Uh, I do love a good bit of Lorinda nonsense. <laughs> it makes me happy. God, it really is just like one of those bots where they fed like a hundred hours of Lorinda speaking into it and this is what yes. came out. <laughs> yeah. Mally to the face, a couple of Rain of Fires in the hand is going to lock this one out. And yeah, Tice was absolutely right to have resigned himself to defeat in this one. He was on an absolute hiding to nothing pretty much throughout the whole thing. No ramp in the early game. Minions not coming into the hand even after he naturally made his way all the way up to seven mana. Really just did not get anything started in that game. The only thing he had available were the Glowfly Swarms, which are the absolute worst way of generating threats in that matchup because it just lines up so perfectly into all of their removals. Particularly, as you so astutely pointed out, against Lee's variation of the deck that has that Hellfire in the bank as well to be able to take care of it. So that one looked doomed right from the opening, but... You know, Tice, I'm sure, is experienced enough to just be able to put a bad beat behind him, move on now. He's still all square in the series. But still, those two Druids uh, that you were talking about might just be the sticking point. They both need to get a win with Druid on either side of this matchup. That's right. And based on the two remaining decks, I'm starting to think that Tice may not be in so good of a spot. You know, uh, with uh, that being a pretty big loss, I think the Warlock was fairly easy for him to prey on with either the Druid or the Hunter. I know that on Twitter at the moment, Bloody Face, Orange, some of the best players in the world are saying, imagine thinking Hunter is favored against Quest Warlock. I don't care what they're saying, okay? I'm a dumb dumb, and Warlock just doesn't beat Hunter. It just dies before anything else can happen. And so I think for Tice, that would have been a decent way to start preying on that Warlock. But now that it's out of the way, things are looking a lot more amenable for Lee. Yeah, I did have that argument at length with Raven as well during Season 1 of Grandmasters, where I was playing a lot of Quest Warlock at the time, and I did have a positive win rate against Hunter. But having, we're like, okay, let's stop arguing about this and actually sit down and test it. So yeah. I did, you know, I tested it against Raven, I tested it against TJ. And in our experience, you know, the Hunter was coming out slightly ahead, um, you know, when, when two players of relatively equal skill were matched up as opposed to me versus average ladder player. Um, so... <laughs> Um, yeah, I, I still, I wonder how much the effect of Dragon Queen Alexstrasza being, giving the one cost dragons now does have an impact on the matchup because that did happen a lot in that you're scrambling for big ball clears, then all of a sudden they force your twisting nether and then boom, suddenly there's 20 damage of dragons back on the right. board immediately afterwards again, which they can't really do now. Um, so maybe that has a big enough impact to gain the couple of percentage points back for the Warlock, because that's honestly all I feel it is, is just a small favorable for the Hunter. Um, but outside of that, we're going to see Tice going back to the well again with this Dragon Druid, it looks like, so we can uh, dig back into that one a little bit later on if we get there. Yeah, he's got the bad luck out of the way. He's purged himself of uh, any curses. And I think at this point, should be looking at a slightly better draw on average. Uh, even though we have seen and uh, some slightly weird play from Tice on the uh, the Druid earlier on, especially when he's up against the Druid. It's gonna, uh, sorry, against the Demon Hunter. It's gonna be a tough spot, most certainly, to get the win. Uh, but I will say, Sotl, for your interest, if you are uh, so interested, about his weird decision to mulligan away Ysera when he had yes. uh, the Breath of Dreams. I was roasting him about it on stream uh, when he was doing his celebration stream yesterday after his top eight. And he was just still defending it. He thought it was correct. Okay. You don't want to keep Ysera. Breath of Dreams is, in his opinion, like that little bit too... I can't remember the exact word. He used greedy, optimistic, or slow, whatever you want to go for. And I think he instead just wanted to try and find Emerald Explorer to go along with it which uh, yeah, I, I find pretty baffling. I've, I mean, I've certainly heard that debate. I've seen players on all sides of that argument 
um, against aggro in particular. Obviously, in slower matchup, you're keeping any dragon and you're keeping breath. Like sure. that's that's just a given. But I've heard people say against aggro they don't keep dragons. I've heard them say they keep Emerald Explorer, but they don't keep the uh, mm. the big top end dragons. And I've seen people say that they keep all dragons if they have the Breath of Dreams in their hand as well. So I think the community is relatively split upon it. Um, but yeah, it was a, certainly a talking point yesterday as, as Tice chose to throw it away. But I had a feeling, like, I didn't think he just threw away the dragon because he didn't notice it was there. Like, right, you know, he right, certainly right. thought it was correct, and I imagine he would have you know, stuck with it and continued to defend it afterwards because Tice is an excellent player and he tends to have a thought process behind the things that he's doing. He does indeed. But now, Sol, it is time for me to put you on the spot. Mm. With the newest version of Demon Hunter, now that Warglaives has been nerfed, quite clearly it becomes worse in most matchups. However, I have the idea that it may be better against Druid because of all the extra early game put in. Do you think that is true or is that not true? I... I mean, I'd, I'd love to be able to definitively call you an idiot in this scenario, yes. but I don't, I don't have enough data under my belt to be confident to do that. That's why it's on the spot. My findings have been the opposite, though. Personally, for me, I think this matchup has taken a big hit from the Glaive, uh, from the Warglaives nerf, because now, if they have the early uh, Glowfly Swarm, which is the only thing that really beat you either way a lot of the time, you don't really have the ability to line up Warglaives into it and be able to continue pushing through. And I think that really, really sucks. Like, even if it's not the Glowfly Swarm and it's the Mount Cellar, quite often, you know, Mount Cellar Iron Bark is still something that got dealt with by uh, Warglaives and Twin Slice and Hero Power, maybe if you had enough powers, um, enough mana to line that up. Now that's just not going to be the case because Druid's going to be ramped so far ahead of you that you're probably only going to be on about five or six with the nerfed Warglaives to be mm. able to line up big tempo pushes. So I think in the games that you were going to lose, you lose them more often now because of the Warglaives nerf. Whereas the games where they don't really have a fast start, you're going to win those with any build of Demon Hunter just by playing minions on curve, right? That is true, but I think the most recent build has already directly affected this game because we just saw Tysco coin Bogbeam on mm. this Bone Chewer Brawler, which I think in the old build without Guardian Orc Merchants, you wouldn't really care that much about. Maybe it gets stuck in the worst case scenario with a beaming Psychic to go to five health. But if there mm. was a Guardian Orc Merchant to follow that up to make a 4-2 with Divine Shield, Druid's yeah. not removing that for the entire game. Yeah. No, I, I do agree with that much. The Gordian, uh, Gordian, Gordon Org Merchant <laughs> is um, a close personal <laughs> friend of mine and is a very useful card in this matchup for sure because Divine Shield's not really something that Druids interact with particularly well. This Druid yeah. deck, more so than any in history, does not want to be using Hero Power to pick off Divine Shields. You know, as efficient as that might seem, it's just way too slow and smacking your face into Demon Hunter minions to remove Divine Shields is really not what you're interested in. So having to throw multiple removal spells into the same minion to deal with Divine Shields is certainly a huge problem. It is indeed, but man, there is just already so much to unpack going on in this game. We just saw Lee unloading double Twin Slice hero power and sending it all to the face on that last turn without any idea about card advantage, any of that nonsense that you learn as a <laughs> budding Hearthstone player and just smacking his opponent in the face. And then following all of that up with a vanilla 5-mana 6-4, Derek. Mm, it's just overstated. <laughs> is this your new thing? Just every Battlecry minion now is just overstated? 6 attack on a 5-drop? Hello? <laughs> Insane. 10 stats on a 5-drop? Hello? That's literally twice as good as it should be. End of conversation. The vanilla curve is 5-6. That's 11 stats. Uh, I don't have time to argue about this, Sol. I'm busy watching Lee win. Okay, as he's now okay, just, okay. what, one game, uh, one damage. Oh, no, sorry, I take it all back. He's got he it. has the lethal yeah. on this turn. He can add a little bit better than I can. And at the end of it all, we do get a reminder of even when you're almost entirely floating turn four here as the Demon Hunter, you just beat Druid. Yeah, no real response there from Tice. It was a pretty clutch draw, honestly, from yeah. uh, Lee there right at the end because it was a crucial turn. 
where Tice was going to start to get into some interesting plays of his own. And uh, Lee's hand was pretty dead, honestly, with a skull that would have been locked middle. So the draw yeah. from the right-hand side would have unoutcasted it. If that card ended up being something cheap and unimpactful, then maybe Tice would have had a uh, an option to be able to come back into the game. But it being the perfect lethal card is, of course, the dream scenario for Lee. Um, but honestly, that was flipped on its head of what we saw from Tice doing earlier with Rogue, which was just maximum power every single turn under all costs. You know, you said card efficiency went out of the window. You know, even the battle cry value went out of the window as well as you just tempoed out the uh, Gladebound yeah. Adept. Something similar that we, we saw with uh, Zim against Tice yesterday, I believe, where he just tempoed out a Rotness Drake because he had, you know, the ability to just tempo yeah, and push sick. through uh, against the Druid in a lot of spots. So sometimes you do have to recognize those positions where, you know, you might be missing four damage, but you are front-loading six damage in that spot, which can set you up for more efficient lethals. Yeah, I mean, that's going to happen more and more. As long as Demon Hunter remains a thing in its current build, now that Twin Slice costs one, you are going to be seeing a lot of the uh, Glaive Bounds just coming down on five as an overstated five drop. Uh, but <laughs> Tice now on the Highlander Hunter. He's not liking his chances anymore on the Druid, it would seem. Doesn't want to get 03 swept on it as... Uh, it's now his last chance. He has only one more loss that he can take before Lee advances to the semi-finals to fight against Alu Temu. And it would be a pretty heartbreaking way to go out. Let's you know, a straight up repeat begin. of Yong Shipping, where he had an incredible run through the Swiss after not having done either of the two prior Masters tours in the year, and then not straight out in the top eight. I, uh, while I would be delighted to see either of these players through to the semi-final, I at least want to see a game five here, because I think this is a series deserving of all five games. Yeah, for sure. And I think it's honestly something that we haven't paid enough service to here as well, is that this is back-to-back -back top eight now from Tice. You know, we've talked about the achievements... Is, uh, achievements? Is, what is wrong with me today? The achievements <laughs> of uh, Blyze and, of course, Dead Drawer as well in terms of their consistency overall. But back-to-back -back top eight, I think sniffed at from uh, Tice's side. It's also not to be sniffed at from Tice's side is this draw. This is the kind of hand that I have been talking about. Against Druid, you have to be quick as anything in order to get over the finish line, because otherwise, even if it's just coined out on turn four with no other ramp, Glowfly Swarm will just push you out of the game. There's yep. very little way for Hunter to effectively deal with it outside of Zephyrus. And so the best response is kill them very, very fast, which every single card in Tice's hand is screaming to do exactly that. Oh, now the Fairy Dragon on top of that as well. Hmm. It's tough to know whether Stormhammer coming down is going to fill the curve better. It feels like it is, especially since he has the dragon lined up for turn four with a base of Fey Wing anyway. He can then, if he draws one, two, or three drop in his next couple of draws, he can use that fairy dragon to smooth out the curve on turn three. Um, but Lee is not going to hang around here. Just throw out that ramp with the overgrowth. He's going to find his way to that slightly awkward six mana turn you always get when you coin out the overgrowth. Yeah, I think it's pretty smart as well for Tice to hold on to a dragon in this instance, but if he gets Rotnest for the Corrosive Breath as well yep. that's already in hand, uh, it's just going to be doing as much damage anyway. So I really, really like uh, this plan that Tice is going for here. And it does mean that Lee, on the back foot, could have been tempted, I suppose, to go for the Emerald, uh, Emerald Explorer sorry, in order to keep himself alive. But instead, he's populating the board, tanking this 13 damage yet again, and praying it'll be enough to get there. Yeah, and the heal being absolutely crucial there. Tice now does at least have to uh, pay attention to this Glowfly Swarm board <laughs> to figure out how much of it he wants to pick apart. He has to realize, oh, wait, I have an opponent in this game. Hmm. Yes, exactly. My opponent is an actual sentient living Hearthstone class <laughs> and not just a face for me to hit with my minions. <laughs> So the obvious uh, most effective way to clear the board on this turn is Corrosive Breath Fairy Dragon. But how important do you think it is to actually clear off the 2-2s two versus just developing as much stats as possible to kind of do a similar thing next turn? It's hard to give you an objective answer to that question when I am staring, laser-focused at this double savage roar in Lee's hand right now. Right, but, right. You know, honestly, sight unseen, average ladder game, double savage roar is rarely something that I'm going to play around. Um, but Tice here, I think, is going to do his best. 
to clear this up because I do say I do still even allowing for one savage roll, which is I think yeah. what you would mainly consider here. It does create extremely efficient trades and a huge tempo swing if you just leave up the entire board in that scenario, right? It does. It does. Whoa, what twenty? two damage I'm seeing on this turn available for Lee. Um, which obviously yep. is not a possibility if you're not going to be winning the game. So it switches over to clearing the board in the best way possible. But does that come in the form of removal spells? Or Emerald Explorer? How important is it to stick that taunt in the way? Or It's close, I think. So it's if you really went... close. If you went Explorer, you'd be, what, bog-beaming the 5-4, trading 1-2-2, two, two, and then killing the Fairy Dragon and leaving the rest alone? You'd, so you'd I be leaving the Evasive guess. Feywing on board? Yeah, I mean, I was kind of just wondering if you just uh, save the bog-beam and just trade all your minions instead to get the untargetables out the way. Sure, but, no, that's uh, fair. Uh, that's very fair. It, either way, I think, is a similar outcome. Um, although, sorry, I guess having said that, your line of leaving a 2-2 two, two on board does play around Rotness that little bit better, so I'd probably uh, prefer your approach. But that's just one line overall. There's also the line of playing the Savage Roll and mopping yes. up all of these minions and hoping that that is enough rather than getting the taunt in the way. Yeah, it's tough. My issue with this line is now that you're passing the full turn back to uh, Hunter and saying, well, I really hope you don't have strong development here or else I'm kind of stuck back in the same position. Like you're saying, I want to contest your next minion with my Emerald Explorer and hope that's good enough. And I don't know how likely that is to be the case in this scenario. Yeah. As it stands, he's just dead on board to the Dragon Bane, but obviously a lot of different scenarios it could have gone through there. And Derek, you have got your wish. We are, in fact, going to be seeing the Game 5 in this one. And what a way to close things out as uh, Tys decides it's all just a little bit too much for him. And he needs to take a break <laughs> before we head uh, into Game 5. As it is going to be the Druid Mirror to close things out. It's uh, quite a relationship that I personally have had with this mirror over my weeks casting at APAC GM. Where every single player was bringing Druid almost every week it felt like. Um, and although at first I was... Uh, approaching the point of not even trying to analyze them properly at all because i was just saying uh you know it's just glowfly swarm whoever does that first is the winner i've seen more and more as the builds change and especially now that we've seen a glowfly ner uh, sorry a fungal fortunes nerf you have that little bit higher chance of approaching the end game where things get a bit more interesting yeah so genuinely if you had to put a number on it what would you say the average turn timer of a, a turn time of a apac druid mirror was up until this point in season one of gm <laughs> well it's hard to remember right because when they had seven mana that meant it was turn three yes, so i'm trying yeah, to figure right, out right. what the turn timer actually was <laughs> but if i had to guess i'd say on average it was like turn eight or something because there were a bunch of the games okay. that just ended on turn five but some of them went on for ages which really like drags it on so maybe like eight nine ten something like that it's it's slower than i would actually think because i have the bias towards the, the memorable games that ended on turn five or something uh but one thing i will say is that uh when all those games were going on, and there were a bunch of Druid matchups, uh, a lot of players on Twitter were just going, lol, Druid, one player drew the correct hand. But I remember RDU in particular was having an absolute field day, pointing he out was. every yeah. single mistake yeah. that the players were making along the way in uh, all the regions, as I remember, with Druid. I think which just perfectly demonstrates that when you have a player who has sat down and just uh, powered through all the preserved. games, figured out the weird tricks of the deck like RDU did, uh, you do realize that there's a lot more to it than meets the eye. Yes, and almost all of those plays that RDU was pointing out and suggesting seem to involve crystal powering your own yes. minions. That did, that did <laughs> seem to be a common theme throughout everything he was saying was wrong. So, and I missed Tip it. Number one. Every time. Every time. Yep. It just didn't even occur to me. Yep. Well, we're already looking at a pretty juicy hand from uh, Tice here with Fungal Fortunes into oh, Glowfly. Yes. Really not even too bad that it costs three uh, instead of two at this point. The only thing you're missing out on is Vate, Vate, Glowfly, I suppose, if you're a true Druid player. Yep. Now Overgrowth come along to support that as well, but he would quite happily, I would imagine, trade that Overgrowth for an Innovator here off this uh, Fungal Fortunes. Mm -hmm. There it is. Third spell oh. as well. Third spell as well. Oh. That is the dream opener for Tice in the matchup. Early Glowfly 
as we were joking about in the intro, can just end games here. And crucially, as the player going first, you can see how important that innovate is because it offsets the coin from the opponent and actually means that you are the first player to be hitting Glowfly, whereas usually, if you don't draw the innovate, your opponent will coin it out before you are able to do so. Yeah, Tice is going to uh, skate to one plan and one plan only with Glowfly Swarm coming down as soon as possible. The response from Lee, now that Starfall is uh, all but completely disappeared from the list, is pretty much only, I think, coin uh, into his own Glowfly Swarm, and then just pray that Tice doesn't have Savage Roar, or Soul of the Forest, or Power of the Wild, <laughs> or just his own removal spells to clear them off. <laughs> Oh, is this what it's like to be an APAC caster, Derek? Is this is this your job? Is this what you do all day? Yep, for three minutes each day. This yep. is what I do. Yep, four times seven is twenty-eight. Plus two is thirty. Tice, you you are chilling, my friend. <laughs> what a way for Tice to get through to the semi-final. Last time in Yongchuping, he only got to the quarterfinals, but this time at the final hurdle, two losses with the Druid, third time is the charm, and he is gonna be going through to the semi-finals to be facing off against Alu Temu. And uh, my heart goes out to Lee. He has done a tremendous job here, and as I hear in the Chinese Hearthstone system, also absolutely crushing it. But at the end of the day, it's Tice, man. You, you can't beat this guy. Yeah, and I love seeing what it means to him still. Obviously, we didn't quite see it in the close-up there, but in his in his webcam frame, as the game was ending, multiple fist bumps, big uh, breaths of relief as well. Like, you could understand someone who's been doing it since 2014, like Tice has been doing at the highest possible level, and is now yeah. pretty much just a made man in Hearthstone, in content creation, in esports as a whole. Pretty much anything he wants to do, he can probably do with the legacy that he's built up to this point. You might just think that he would be taking it all in his stride at this point, but that's not who he is. He is a competitor, and when he shows up for a tournament, doesn't matter if it's his first tournament in six months or whatever, as was the case quite often before GM became a thing that we wouldn't see him for large stretches of time and then he'd enter this one random tournament out of the blue. He takes every tournament he enters absolutely seriously and that is why you cannot count him out even at this point, so many years down the line, he is still a top level competitor and that is some semi-final we have got, Derek. Oh, it absolutely is. I, I think that Similar to how my heart is somewhat torn here, like Alu Temu is one of my undeniable favorite players to watch in APAC, both in his gameplay, in his reactions as well. He's clearly a very dank human being uh, from his Twitter <laughs> interactions as well, which I of all people appreciate a lot. But also I'm a huge Tice fan. He's super nice, he's super good at the game. Like you said, he's still committed to competitive Hearthstone esports despite having every avenue in life open to him. And I think mm -hmm. similar to me, There'll also be a lot of uh, Japanese Hearthstone fans who are pretty torn because despite Ali Temu obviously being the flag bearer now for their country, I think there's a lot of pretty big Tice fans uh, amongst the Japanese Hearthstone community from what I see on Twitter as, I mean, I suppose that's not really worth saying because everyone loves Tice. But the point is that I think it's going to be a cracker of a semi-final and uh, my allegiance is torn. Yeah, absolutely agree with you. Cannot wait to get started with that one. But we still have two more quarterfinals to deal with. And there are some incredible players on the bottom half of that bracket as well. The likes of Bunny Hopper and Just Saiyan still ready to come up again. It just goes to speak as to how stacked this top eight was overall coming into it, that you do not want to miss a single match. You do not. So without any further ado, we are going to go to a very short break while we set up our next game. I believe we are going to be seeing the likes of uh, X-Hope uh, up against... Uh, in the other seat, uh, Bunny Hopper, uh, I Bunny believe, Hopper. as yep. our th uh, third quarterfinal match. Sorry, getting my uh, schedule a bit torn up here, but <laughs> it is going to be Exo as the other Chinese competitor in top eight, hopefully trying to avenge Lee after he was taken down by Tice. And of course, Bunny Hopper needs no introduction. So we will go to a short break. And when we come back, our third quarterfinal match of the day.